Are you ready for some React? <laughs> Hello, nobody's home? Come on. Do you enjoy the conference? How is it? Is it good so far? No, yes. Come on, talk to me, guys. Ah, OK. <laughs> so hi, my name is Martin Hochel. I work as a software engineer in a company called Embed IT. Maybe you notice them here. Uh, besides working, I'm doing a lot of other stuff. For instance, I'm running the biggest JavaScript meetup here in Prague called NG Party, and I like to do a lot of open source. I'm author of NG Metadata, the best AngularJS yet. I'm also core member of SkateJS, the reactive type safe web component library. And if I'm not bashing my keyboard, you can find me skateboarding, snowboarding, surfing, whatever, depends on the weather condition. All right, enough about me. I have to confession and make. I really like backend developers who switch to front end. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, why is that? Because they all speak the same language as I do. Okay, probably most of you sitting here read the famous book Design Patterns from Gang of Four, right? I haven't, just kidding. So now maybe you're asking where I did learn that language if I'm a front end engineer or whatever. Well, I used to be a Java developer as you long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. But then I met someone who showed me the true power of programming language. And also this law was invented. So obviously, after reading this, I started living tag life with JavaScript. So how does JavaScript look like? It looks something like this, right? You have some sinus wave of undefined. Amazing. Just a magic. Or maybe not. I don't know. <laughs> Eventually, if you'll start using JavaScript, you may run in potential issues and need to buy some pills with the book, of course. Like, JavaScript doesn't scale, right? You cannot refactor it. Or type safety, hello, because it's dynamic language. So the question is, how do I JavaScript? I do TypeScript. What is TypeScript? TypeScript is JavaScript that scales. What does it mean? Well, basically, it's just a superset of JavaScript with some sugar and types provided. And it's also type checker and a compiler. How do you use it? Well, you write TypeScript files, as you normally would do JavaScript files with .ts extension. Then you run TypeScript compiler, which produces old good vanilla JavaScript. And of course, you can configure the compiler to provide output which you need for your consumers. Simple as that. Now why? Why do I need this kind of stuff? Oop. Sorry. So let's say you have some simple function, right? Which does nothing special in particular, just summing two values, and you call it the number. Well, the output is four, obviously. But then, because you're in JavaScript, you can provide string. And suddenly, you notice this doesn't do what you think it does. Why? Because JavaScript is dynamic, and it will overload the plus operator, and it will not output the sum of numbers, but it will concatenate those strings, which is uh, not very unfortunate. On the other hand, if you use TypeScript, you can explicitly provide type annotations of the function. And now, if you try to run the function with the same arguments, you get immediate feedback that there may be some problem, right? Because string is not a number, dude. So that's why. TypeScript is even more smarter. Nowadays, you don't have to write TypeScript at all. You can just provide JSDoc annotations in your existing JavaScript apps and TypeScript understands that and will immediately notify you that something is wrong, which is very convenient if you want to do a gradual upgrade 
from vanilla JavaScript to TypeScript. Anyway, this presentation is about building UI that scales, okay? So let's see how. But before that, let's look in the past, right? How, how did we build those apps in past? Probably most of you use jQuery. Any jQuery fans? Hello, nobody? Oh, not so many. Okay, so uh, whatever. Then some smart invented these tools. Google App Toolkit, Vadin, Wicked. Anyone using those? Come on. Yeah, a lot of you. <laughs> so yeah, this felt for me like I don't want to live on this planet anymore when I saw that. But fortunately, nowadays, I feel so refreshed because we're building these apps with a single page application model, which is basically heavy data driven and really feels like a native app, not like a web app anymore. So yeah, looks good. And when I say scalable app, you will probably need some framework, right? So uh, you can choose, there is just one, right? Or actually there isn't just one. There are thousands of frameworks, like JavaScript ecosystem is really crazy. So which one to pick? Angular, Ember, Vue.js, I don't know. But I know what I did pick. We, cho we choose React. I will show you why and what React is. So React is a JavaScript library for, bu for building user interfaces. Notice the word library, not a framework. So if you are using React, basically a whole application is a set of functions. What do I mean by that? Your UI element is a function, a pure function, which gets some properties. And based on the properties, it gives you some output. It renders the view. Of course, you can provide some internal state for a component, for a function if you need to, but it's not the common behavior, like the traditional one is just providing props and executing the pure function, which is really predictable and functional principle, which is good. Also, React starts and ends with components. Your whole app is component driven. There is no more MVC anymore. There are just components. Which are those functions? And how does a component look like? This is some contrived example written in TypeScript. So first off, you define public interface of your component with props. Then you define that component by a class, which extends from component. Then you have to define a render method, which will return your view. And in the end, you need to mount that component to your DOM to render that stuff. Okay, super simple. So uh, maybe you notice this abomination, like what's that? Like HTML and JavaScript, is, is this even valid? This is called JS6 and it's just invention like XML with JavaScript combined. And it provides us declarative UIs, like we can write view in declarative manner and what, what is done under the hood by transpiler is it, it, it transpiles that JS6 into imperative function calls. So we stay declarative, but under the hood, it's imperative. And like this function execution creates just POJOs, simple immutable JavaScript objects. And maybe thinking like, hmm, why do I need those? Well, React uses virtual DOM. So basically your whole tree is a set of these objects. And when some part of the object changed, it will apply a diff algorithm and render just the small re-render re -render just a small port in the DOM. So it's pretty efficient for large scale apps. Here does look like with TypeScript. Like you provide a component and I get immediate feedback that I didn't provide a name property. Okay, so let's use some IntelliSense. I immediately see the API of the component, so I will use name because there is a name, and I provide a value, a string, 
let's say Jane, everything works. And if I try to put there some type that isn't allowed, I got immediate feedback by TypeScript. I can also traverse the code base just by clicking, like you used to from Java, of course. And I can also refactor. Let's rename it to greeting, the prop, in the type definition, not in the implementation. Bang. Everything renamed, just one, one, one operation. Type safe. Amazing, right? So as a recap, React is very easy to learn. It, it adheres to functional approaches. It uses templating system within the language. You don't have to learn new DSL like with Angular or whatnot. And it's, in the end, just JavaScript. In our case, TypeScript. Until you start build something, right? Something like this. Let me introduce you a 900 lines component. This doesn't scale, right? But eventually, you may end up with something like this. At least, we ended with some similar stuff. So how do we build scalable enterprise React apps? Let's see. Well, we have the language, right, TypeScript. We have the renderer, the library, React. And we need a lot other stuff to build a whole app. So let's start from the bottom. First off, you need some task runner and package manager for your app. We are using Yarn. What is Yarn? Yarn is a fast, reliable, and secure dependency management, and also a task runner. Under the hood, it uses NPM, I mean, node packages, but it lives on its own. And it's super fast, it works offline, and yeah, just use it. <laughs> uh, this is how you declare your task within package.json. So it's just a JSON object, no biggie. And this is how you execute. You just run yarn start from the command line, and it executes the command that you provided. And you can run any shell commands with yarn. Next up, you need bundler. We are using Webpack, which is kind of industry standard nowadays in front end. And what is Webpack? Like, Webpack is a bundler that bundles JavaScript modules, right? Because we don't have JavaScript modules in all browsers yet. So we need to, we need to somehow to bundle all those files to one. So Webpack is a tool for this, for this job. And it's even more powerful because you can use JavaScript module syntax to import and other files, like images, text files, SVG, whatever. And in the end, it produces just a static assets in vanilla downscale JavaScript with all those dependencies that you used within your imports, which is what you need. There is a small problem, though. Like, Webpack isn't very easy to configure, and you may need well, some developer task force, all right? Like, uh, we tackled this problem, but uh, it wasn't pretty, pretty easy path. So just to be aware of that. Unfortunately, uh, Facebook and open source community uh, built tools for us. You can use this Create Re React app, which is a CLI that scaffolds and build the whole stack for you. So uh, let's build the whole React app in 30 seconds or so. All right, so uh, it already ran the script, and it scaffolds everything, and you just run yarn start, and bang, there is your app, OK? You can start immediately building your products. You don't have to tackle with scaffolding, et cetera, et cetera, which is pretty powerful. OK, what about more tooling, shall we? So uh, uh, for sure, you know that feeling when you are on code review and you are arguing with some colleague like, hey, dude, this space there, can you remove it? Or those braces, can you put them on the new line? This is such a waste of time. And there are tools for that. We are using Prettier, 
which is a code formatter. Kind of opinionated, but it works. It formats automatically your code, so you don't have to deal with that. Then, obviously, you need some style guides. We are using TSLint, which enforces those style guides and fixes them for us, if possible. Then, we are using Git and Node.js tools like Husky and Lint Staged, which are triggered during pre-commit hooks and apply Prettier and TSLint on our codebase, so we don't have to do it manually. Then, we have conventional changelog with commitism. In a large project, you need some style guides for your commit messages, right? You don't have to like write blah, blah, blah. You need some structure. For that, we are using commitism. And in the end, standard versioning and another CLI tool for releases. And let's see how it looks like all together. So uh, here we already used commitism which, uh, oh, okay, let's, uh, let's wait <laughs> for the GIF to rewind. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so th this is our code. It's not formatted properly, right? So uh, we have some staged files in a Git, and we will run yarn CZ, CZ which will invoke commitism. Here we are providing the type of the commit. We are providing a message, like add a module replacement. Then we can provide some additional messages. We don't need all those in this case. And we'll run Husky and Prettier and TSLint on our code base automatically. It doesn't create additional commits because it's like appended, amended during the commit. So this is our outcome, the, the formatted code without any issues. And if we check the git log, there is a new log with conventional change log message. So all standardized. And why is this all good for? It's for releases. Like this is our log of our project. And thanks to this conventional change logs, we can provide something like this by tooling. And this also bumps the semantic versions correctly, right? So if we introduce some breaking change, it will bump the major version Etc. Etc. Okay, tooling covered. What about architecture? So how do we structure components? So as I said, like with React, you have component-driven approach. The whole app is a tree of components. And how to structure them? Well, you have two kinds of components. Smart, which know how things work. They contain business logic, uh, API calls, whatever. And then you have dump components, which just know how things look. So you provide the props, and it renders. And if you click on some button within the dump component, it just triggers some emit event that is propagated to the smart component, and the smart component does its logic again. Well, this scales just OK until it doesn't. This is pretty much okay-ish for small application, but we are talking about enterprise apps, right? So uh, this is some contrived smart component. Do you see any issues? Any potential code smells? No one? All right, what about this? I import some HTTP client service, and then I use that within some lifecycle hook of React. Like, how would you unit test this? Mocking, yes! But now you have two problems, right? So how's the what's this, what is the solution? Dependency injection. And now you may be like, dependency injection in JavaScript and in React? Wow, this guy is crazy. <laughs> so let's see how it looks like. We are providing some injectables object, which is just a singleton of our services or whatever we want to share. Then we are using provider pattern, which is a specific pattern of React, and providing that injectables to our tree. By this, that object is available 
for our whole tree, okay? You can also scope it to some particular nodes if you want to, but this is like how it works overall. And then you just define your API. Here we are using some map types of TypeScript. I love TypeScript, it's just so amazing. You don't have to write much, it just works. And then the component will get those injectables via props. So I destructure that. I get the immediate HTTP client and I call it. And maybe wondering, like, how did I put it there, right? So uh, just functional approach. I'm using here some inject function, which includes some map, map function, where I'm selecting just the injectables that will be injected to the component. And in the end, I'm carrying that function and invoking it on that component. So what I get in the end is a new enhanced component with those injectables provided. So now I can pretty easily test this component. So in a nutshell, React dependency injection works with React context, provider pattern, and this inject is called high order component pattern. And there are other solutions as well. If you wanna go crazy with DI and JavaScript, you can use inversify.js. We don't need that, so. Done. I'm done here. Am I? Well, again, this is our component where the HTTP client is injected. So uh, any issues there? Looks good, right? Well, it introduces kind of still tight coupling because there is still that logic inside the component. And what if I change the logic? What, what will I do then? Okay, this doesn't scale. So uh, eventually, if you use that, you will end with architecture like this. So you, have, you are injecting those data models in various three nodes. Your messaging stuff is kind of convoluted and just a chaos. And it's really hard to add new features or find bugs in this kind of system. So how do we handle that within our apps? <laughs> well, we use Redux. What is Redux? Basically, those are the trees of your components, right? So just child component notify the parent components that something happened. And, the par and we have some global store, which is a single source of truth of your data model of the whole app. And our parent component are emitting some actions to that store. The store changes according to those actions. And then it notifies, again, those smart components. And those smart components trigger renders to the whole tree. Simple as that, eventing system. And uh, that's state management. How do we handle service layer or business logic? Well, we are using just classes. Simple as that. So uh, again, we are using dependency injection provided by constructor pattern in JavaScript, in our case TypeScript. Again, I have type annotations because I'm using TypeScript, which is awesome. And those services are really simple. They are just doing what they're supposed to do. No tie coupling, they are doing one thing, good. So that's service layer. And okay, and how is communication working between the service layer and Redux? Well, we need to inject those services somehow, somewhere. And for that, we are using epics. And what is an epic? Well, epic is the basic instance of Redux Observable. And Redux Observable is RxJS on steroids, <laughs> provided for side effects management in Redux. OK, so uh, how does it look like? Like, what is the epic? Again, epic is just a function where you put the stream of actions and it outputs the stream of actions. Okay, what, what, does, what does it mean, right? So it follows the standard Redux dispatcher pipeline. So someone emits an event, that event goes to reducer, reducers, it creates a new state, and after all reducers have been run, it passes 
forward the message to our epic. And again, epic does some stuff or some logic it invo invokes or services, and in the end, it emits a new action. So that action is again propagated to the reducers, and we have one-way data flow again and again, which we can control, debug, and it's pretty like predictive what is happening within our system. This is how a pick looks like. As I said, it's just a function that accepts stream of actions, and you can filter on which action do you want to react, and you can utilize the whole RxJS operators for your reacti reactive programming. You can cancel events, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, how do you set up the dependency injection for your epics? Well. You just import those services. You also need to import the root epic, which is just a composition of all epic functions from your app. Then we create just simple object of our injectables, and then we invoke create epic middleware, in which we tell and provide the dependencies, which we can inject in our epics. So this is set up. How's the usage? This is some. Again, contrive, fetch user epic. Here, we can use our dependency injection, right? User service, because it's already set up. And within the logic of the Rx filtering pipeline, we're just invoking that service, which returns some new action, which will be, again, emitted to the store. Simple as that. All right, so we have data layer, business logic covered, OK? Last thing, maybe, uh, how this all does all this work with presentation layer, with our components? How do they know about each other? So you need to introduce some sandbox pattern to prevent the tight coupling. And what is a sandbox pattern in React? Well, it's just high order function composition, high, in our case, high order components. So we can use this compose function where we provide various higher the components, which are mapped to Redux or your injection system. And then, within your component, within your component, you just wrap your component with that higher the component function. It's like this. And now, everything is injected to your component via props. So again, super easy to unit test, and there is really no tight coupling because that component doesn't know how the system works. It just calls the functions and renders the data that it gets. OK, that's the architecture basically covered. There are a few more steps that are needed. <laughs> so how do, we how do we keep contracts with backend data models? Well. We have source of truth. It's called Swagger. Probably you heard that. And we have some Node.js tools that can consume that Swagger file and emit TypeScript definitions, the whole schemas. And then the whole schemas are used within our app. So if someone on backend changes some model, we got immediate feedback that something changed because the TypeScript will not compile which is pretty awesome. And now we can blame the backend developers. <laughs> All right, unit testing. Do you write unit tests? Anyone? No? Come on, get out. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> OK. So. Uh, we are using Jest, which is again a tool provided by Facebook and is open sourced. And Jest is a delightful JavaScript testing. And really, it is. Like, there is absolutely zero setup. You just install it, and it works. Everything testing, watchers, uh, code coverage, you name it. And like, Jest invented this kind of super nice feature because, like, your components are just some objects that are rendered with some data, right? There is not much logic. So with Jest, 
you can use snapshotting. What is this? Like basically you write your component and you write your test which will save that snapshot of that current state based on your function arguments on your disk. And if somebody changes some, something, it will yell at you that, hey, this snapshot is not the same anymore. So probably something changed. This is really powerful stuff and you can also apply it on your data models, for instance. It doesn't have to be just the components. End-to-end -end testing. How do you write end-to-end -end tests? I guess maybe Selenium or something like that, right? Well, we are using Test Cafe. What is Test Cafe? It's a Node.js tool to automate and to web testing. And there is no Selenium. It's just JavaScript and it works, it's reliable, and it's super fast. And this is how it, how it works. You just run Test Cafe from your command line. It's cross-platform. And then it runs your browser and does some automatization for you. And why it's cool to use it? Of course, it's cool because it runs just Node.js, right? Obviously. But uh, as I mentioned, this is how we keep contracts with your backend, right? But because the whole end-to-end -end, end -end and unit tests, of course, are written in TypeScript, then we can introduce to our page objects and end-to-end -end tests the same models generated by Node.js. And of course, we can use parts of logic from the app within the unit test. And this is really powerful and efficient. Why? If I refactor something in code base, it gets immediately refactored in my unit test and end-to-end -end test. Amazing. I can sleep now. As for a summary of our whole stack, like we are using a lot of stuff and uh, we plan to open source it, but there was not enough time to do that yet. So maybe stay tuned. And let's recap what did we learn today. React is really possible and it's happening in enterprise. What you need is unidirectional data flow and event-driven system. We are using RxJS, you don't have to. We love Rx. Then you need to provide some service layer, component sandbox, and smart dump components pattern. But as always, your mileage may vary and it depends and there is no silver bullet, right? So. Uh, this suits or needs or apps, but you may have different ones, so. But last thing in this talk, if you didn't take away anything from this talk, just remember one thing. Everything possible with JavaScript is. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, just ask. Sorry? The question was, what do I think about Angular? Uh, I used Angular like three years. I'm uh, not using it anymore because uh, it's like more OOP principle. I like to be more functional, but like in the end, if you are using those, those steps of architecture by abstracting your business logic and data layer to some eventing system, what you will end up is the same system for any framework. So in the end, if you are using Angular or whatever next framework comes, you will use it just as a renderer. So like your logic will always stay in the Redux container, containers. But uh, Angular is definitely a great framework. So uh, it's also very challenging to use React if you have not very skilled team, right? Because there are many tools, et cetera, et cetera, and Angular provides all of this for you. So it's definitely a viable option. Any more questions? Don't be shy, I don't bite. Maybe. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so I guess that's it. 